Hi, I'm Shane Top, and this is my last meal. Every person has exactly two things in common. We all gotta eat and we're all gonna die. Today we're joined by Smosh cast member, host of the Smosh Mouth podcast, winner of the 2009 LA Film Festival Jury Prize, and former student class president of Briarwood Prep, the number one high school in Seattle, Shane Top, welcome to the show. Wow, you really did your research. I really did. Now, do you still have a relationship with Mrs. Pilaf over at Briarwood? I understand she was a big mentor to you. Yeah, yeah. Um, I have not watched that episode in like 10 years, so I'm like, what was the one line I had? Uh, I know they had a helicopter. They had a helicopter. That's all I remember. Miranda Cosgrove thought that you may have thought she drooled on herself. That's right. I'd never seen an episode of that show, and I, I didn't know a lot about your lore because I didn't grow up watching a lot of kids' TV. Mm -hmm. um, that's also where I learned the phrase, where's Demi? Man, heard that so much, and then I heard where's Anthony for a good solid half a decade. You know what? That's I'm my legacy. About? Where's Shane? And Shane is right here, and that's all that matters. And everyone at Smosh is wondering, because I didn't call off of work. So, uh. <laughs> we're, we're basically, we're still the same company, despite. It's all the same. Split. Who cares? Who cares? Uh, but I really appreciate you coming today, man. I'm super stoked. Uh, have you thought about your last meal before? I, you know, what's funny is it's a question my mom would throw at me sometimes. Because my mom's obsessed with, like, true crime, so she was always watching serial killer stuff yeah, when I was yeah. a kid. And they'd be like, oh, they're on death row, and she'd be like, Oh man, I always wonder what I would do for my last meal. I'm like, that's a crazy thought, but uh, okay. And um, so I've thought about it a lot, but not as in depth as I thought about it once you guys emailed me. There was a couple things that I put on this list that I am extremely excited for that I never thought I was gonna have again. So I took advantage of this show to get foods that I have been craving for a long time. As well you should, like Lazarus resurrected from the dead. <laughs> I am so excited. Uh, speaking of which, you think about death often? I used to think about death. I don't know if you know this, but when I was 18 months old, I, I drowned in my pool. Yeah. Smosh fans know it, uh, cause we make fun of it a lot. I drowned, so I was dead for a couple minutes, and then my mom mm. resuscitated me. So growing up, it was just this story that I heard. So it made me think about death a little bit. Um, and then, you know, I feel like I went through that edgy, uh, phase as a teenager mm. where I was really into like f what I thought was philosophy and it yeah. was just thinking of normal things. I used to think about it a lot and now at this stage in life I'm like whatever, whatever man, whatever happens, happens and uh, I, don't, I don't stress about it too much. I love no. that man. Well uh, let's see if we can drag up some of those old traumas today. Great. Ready to get to it? I'm ready. Let's see it. Hey before we get into the meal I'm excited to announce that we are releasing a brand new Last Meals hoodie. Remind the people around you the two things that everyone has in common. We all gotta eat and we're all gonna die. Available now at mythical.com. Shane, for the first course of your final meal, we got the bottled Mexican Coke, only made with pure cane sugar, and then we got the Arby's Curly Fries, best in the game. But here's a piece de resistance. These are Chili's Chicken Crispers. Pre-2022, when they changed the recipe, it used to be a wet batter, making it a very unique tender. Then they switched, like everybody else, to a dry, wet, dry flour dredge. But Shane, these are the king right here. Oh my God, you have no idea how happy I am to see this. When I was crafting my last meal and sending it to you guys, I was sitting there thinking, and this was the one that came to my head. And I was like, oh my God, my opportunity. Because this was my favorite food for most of my childhood, right? Mm. Chili's was my favorite restaurant. And then I remember I got it a couple years ago. They looked they looked different now. And then they tasted like any other chicken tender I've ever had. And I was so sad. You should have been. Like I was That's actually genuinely reaction. devastated. Um, so this was my opportunity. And this was this was my main request. When I emailed you guys, I was like, I need this. Please dig in, because they're, they're dying okay. in the window. You gotta get them all, oh. all they're fresh. Ooh, they're hot. Oh God, they're hot. They're, they're very so hot. crispy. Oh, dude, you can just tell by the look. And see, as a kid, I not even no sauce. I just would bite into these. <laughs> just raw dog in the chicken. What's crisps. wrong with that? Nothing. No, but delicious. It's is good. Mmm. Ha. Ha. Yeah. Oh god. The, the shell is just, and it's so like thick. Mm hmm. Oh man. Well, it's it, crazy. It was such a unique product because there were so few like wet battered chicken tenders out there, and then they just homogen it, homogenized it like everybody else, and mm. it's an absolute shame. You gotta let your freak flag fly, Chili's. People need to need to never go to Chili's again until they change this. We can start the boycott right now. Yeah. <laughs> My favorite childhood restaurant. Never go there ever again. Tell me about the curly fries. So, 
I haven't had Arby's in a long time, but mm -hmm. growing up, Arby's was a regular staple in my household. And I haven't had it in a long time because I feel like people talk shit about Arby's. Yeah, Arby's is very misaligned and I don't like that. Which is interesting because I, I, I'm saying this for the first time here. I really like Arby's. I, I like the sandwiches, but most of all, the curly fries. Shane, that's very brave of you. I know, <laughs> Thank you for guys. speaking your truth. Oh my God. See. I start and then I just start going. Keep going, man. And then just the, the perfect combination of just acid, sweet. Mm-hmm. Mm. Shane, you mentioned almost dying as an 18 month old. You fell into the pool. Mom and dad were having an argument. No one saw you. Mm -hmm. Your dad runs over, pulls you out. Paramedics eventually come. You were completely gray. Yes. By the time the paramedics got there, you said that you weren't traumatized by it because you were an 18 month old, but everybody mm -hmm. around you was. Do you think any amount of that trauma sort of leaked into 18 month old Shane's little subconscious baby brain? I mean, I say they were traumatized. I don't know how much, like I, I, I've said this before, uh, my nickname that my dad and my brother had for me growing up was Shane Bobber. And I didn't understand, I didn't, I, it didn't click for me until I was a teenager. But I was like, oh, I was bobbing up and down in the pool. That's why you're calling me that, that's crazy. So maybe they weren't traumatized. I don't know, man. I think you know your family better than me, but I think a lot of people sort of counter that trauma with mm -hmm. humor. I would have simply called you the boy who lived, but. This was 1992, man. Ah, oh, God. <laughs> only it happened nine years they later. They say it and then suddenly it's a phrase. They're like, wait, hold on. My mom says like, oh, I claimed to have, when they were looking through photo books and stuff, I claimed to have known or seen my great grandfather who had passed away before I was born. So, uh, and I take that all with a grain of salt. I'm like, you know, I was a little mm -hmm. kid. I probably was just saying whatever. When you were a kid and heard that though, did you take that as truth? Because often when you're a kid and like a trusted adult, especially a parent says something, you just assume it to be true. Did you believe when you were a kid that you had the gift of sight? Uh, I, I, I mean, I, I guess I sort of believed that I must have gone somewhere and come back. I don't know now. Mm -hmm. I don't have any memory of it. You know, yeah. I, I haven't. I guess I could try to go to a hypnotherapist and try to see if I can rummage through something. But um, no, I have I have no recollection. I don't really have memories uh, until I'm like four or five, which I think is normal, right? Do people have memories from earlier than that? Definitely. I'm getting some nods. Yeah, big time, like two, three. I have nothing from two. Okay, three, maybe. what do you remember from three? I think maybe, maybe I have a faint little memory of like Halloween mm -hmm. when I was three. But that's, but I don't have much of anything. There was another factor though that came out of you being a little Shane Bobber. Yeah. Uh, the fact that your parents didn't know if you would or wouldn't have brain damage until you were six years old, which that's like a long waiting period from 18 months to kindergarten age. Right. Surely that must have affected the way that they treated you growing up. I wonder. Uh, I mean, once again, they didn't tell me that until I was older. Yeah. Of just, yeah, we, we didn't know. And so I'm like looking back on my memories and my joke is often that I would draw something and be like, hey guys, look what I made. And my parents would be like, oh, uh, like, oh, definitely something's missing up there. But um, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Uh, and, and you know what? I think the jury's still out. Yeah. I think we're still, still yet to be seen. Or I think most Smosh fans could probably tell you that, yes, something something did get damaged, but in a good way, you know? Sure. Kind of like when you hit a jukebox, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Something like that. Uh, you talk about being dubious about your, your mom's potential clairvoyance, but there was one instance with your mom that she claims that seems pretty prescient. She was with an ex at the time who was a pilot. Yeah. And she said, you can't go to work today. There's something wrong with the rings. He goes to work, nothing happens. But that was the day the Challenger exploded. And the yes. reason the Challenger exploded is because the primary and secondary O-rings on the right rocket booster failed. Can yeah. you explain that one away? Yeah, my mom has told this story a lot. And I we do talked. I do believe her because my mom isn't like some person who's claiming stuff all the time. She woke up from this dream and so adamantly like believed that this was gonna happen, that she was begging him not to go to work. Mm -hmm. And then he he went to work. And then yeah, the 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 challenger crash happened that day. I, I believe her. I simply believe her, and I am a very skeptical person. Yeah. But I, I have no reason to believe my mom is just telling this massive lie about this one instance in her life. It's crazy. Do you, do you think you're somebody who likes living in the unexplainable? Because certain things like death that you say, you've kind of made a little bit of peace with, you don't exactly know what happens, but who cares? We're here and 
you don't know exactly you know what your parents thoughts were when you mm-hmm. were in that period between 18 months uh, in kindergarten age do you think you find comfort in that unknown when I was a teenager I was so obsessed with figuring out what happens after you die I think it did come from a f- bit of a feeling of depression of mm. worrying that my life was going to be insignificant. Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of that was I was getting into the acting industry, which is such a like you make it or you don't. Yeah. And so I'm like, oh, my God, I'm placing my all my chips on making it in the acting industry. And if that doesn't happen, I'm just a failure and my life is nothing and insignificant. Now, as you get older, you realize like significance and insignificance sure. is so nuanced. Like your life has meaning on so many different ways. Well, when you say as you get older, you realize that's not the case for all yous out there. I guess that's true. I guess that's true. What do that. you think brought you there? I think failure. I think failures, different kinds of failures. I think my life not turning out how I thought it would. Mm-hmm. Um, and also my life like succeeding in things and realizing, oh, it's not what I thought it was. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I when I started in the acting industry, I had this idea. And then honestly, you, you get onto a set and you're like, oh, it's it's a job. Yeah, It's just a job. It shatters the illusion. And also just the world has changed so much in the past 15 years when I started that I'm like, you're, you're never gonna know what your journey is. And you ha- kind of have to accept that, that it's gonna be so unique. I don't know, I think all of that plays a part in on a deeper philosophical level at this point of just going, this is all so insane. My brain is incapable of comprehending it, but whatever's happening is happening. Yeah. Like this is happening and I have no choice but to keep going as best I can. You're floating on a river and anytime you fight the direction, it just doesn't matter. You're going where the river is. Exactly. Staying. It's that that old like Alan Watts thing of of yeah. You just have the all there is is acceptance. Yeah. That's all you can do. You can't fight it. The truth is the truth, whatever it may be. I hope to someday figure it out, but it probably won't be in life. Mm. But and and maybe when I when I go, there isn't something. I but I guess my philosophical thing that I've always dealt with is I'm like, well, whatever happened before this experience right now, if I if this something came from nothing, and then I go back to nothing, maybe infinity from now I'll become something again but I I have those thoughts on occasion and then I'm like whether I whether I land on if it's the truth or not it doesn't matter so I'm gonna keep eating my chicken crispers Shane when you go to that big chilies in the sky they're gonna have pre-22 crispers and everything is going to be light Mm. and nothing will hurt Mm mm-hmm you ready to go to course number two yeah Chain for course number two, in the natural progression from chili crispers and curly fries, we have dolmare, some lovely stuffed grape leaves, a little bit of ground lamb and rice in there finished in lemon and olive oil. Then we have a nice plate of roasted green veggies. We have broccolini, we have Brussels sprouts, a little bit of baby asparagus in there, and then spiny lobster tails with drawn butter and lemon. And then we have the Kaigan Japanese Sakura Cask Expression Whiskey. Now this is aged in white oak for three years and then it's actually aged for six months in a cherry blossom cask, giving it some more chocolatey and cherry notes. Okay. Uh, cheers, man. Cheers. Thanks for stopping by, this hey, rules. Thanks for, thanks for doing this for me. Mm. Yeah. That's good. That's really good. I, I love Japanese whiskey. It's just so smooth. It is, and they, they like take a lot of care and craft into it, especially with really cool expressions like this, aged in cherry blossom cask. Like, mm-hmm. where the hell are you gonna get that? Uh, do you ever make cocktails at home? Like, are you a big social drinker? It, during lockdown, mm-hmm. I bought a couple cocktail cookbooks from uh, Death & Co. Yeah. And I was obsessed with going through them and making these really weird cocktails. Mm-hmm. I was buying ingredients that I could only use for one thing. I'm yeah. like, oh, I have aloe liqueur. What else am I gonna use that you for? You have Charot aloe liqueur? I had it <laughs> okay. at one point. I made this cocktail called a lily pad, which was aloe liqueur, um, was it chartreuse? Um, and gin and a bunch of other things, but I got really into cocktails. And uh, But my favorite cocktails are, at this point, just the classics. Mm. Love martinis, I love Manhattans, old fashions, because I, I love the feeling of getting punched in the face. Yeah. I uh-huh. don't like sweet stuff. That's like, how we're actually gonna end this video, is just is, you and I rock em sock em each other until one of us actually dies. Okay, good. Mm. Did you read their guide on how to shake with ice? Bro, and I'm just like, come on, man, I can't do this. It's gotta be circular. 
circular so the ice doesn't break with the vertical motion. Yeah, I, I was like, all right, I I'm not doing this, but I, I respect it. <laughs> Dude, tell me about the spiny lobster okay, specifically. Okay, so spiny lobster, this is a nostalgic pick for me. I know that most lobster you get is not spiny lobster, right? Yeah, a lot of it's like a main lobster is different yeah. are uh, the big uh, crusher claws, they call them. Yes, so growing up, my family would go to Key West uh, every summer, and my dad, uh, is obsessed with catching lobsters there in Key West. It's spiny lobster. Mm -hmm. So as a young kid, I would go along with him. Now I'm just snorkeling around. I'm not catching the lobster, but my dad would be diving around, going under coral heads, grabbing them, using the tickle stick to. You, you using put, the you what now? Use a tickle stick and a net. Okay. And you you find the lobsters and you basically smack them on the face, and they swim backwards into your net. That's how you catch spiny lobsters. Or if you can reach and just grab them, they you know they don't have claws, so mm. my dad would just be grabbing them. Um, but we would we'd get a bunch or whatever the amount that you could get um, mm. with a license, and then we'd cook them up, and it was always solid. Uh, so it's a very nostalgic childhood thing for me. That's a very dad thing to do. Mm. Mm hmm. You didn't have the traditional American high school experience. You were a working kid actor. You said you put a lot of pressure on yourself. Do you think a lot of that pressure was self-imposed? Or do you think a lot of that was coming from the fact that your entire social circle were people trying to book roles over each other? Or at that point, did kids even have any sort of responsibility in that as far as the pressure put on them? There's a, there's a, yeah, uh, huh, um, <laughs> there's an interesting thing with child actors that I, that I observed, which is when we were young, when we were teenagers and stuff, everyone's very mature mm. because they all know how to present themselves. They all know how to act like an adult. Yeah. But then, so so yes, there was this extreme pressure we're all putting on ourselves because you're you're 15 and you're thinking about your career, yeah. which is something I look back on. And I'm like, you shouldn't be thinking about that. I taught kids dodgeball at a science camp. Not a lot of pressure there. That Shane. sounds awesome. Yeah. I think the adults in my life all meant really well and it was all very positive. But, you know, you are, inevitably putting a ton of pressure yeah. on people when you're going, oh man, you have this incredible talent. Oh my gosh, you could be in movies. You could do You could do this. Yeah, yeah. You have the ability to do this. So then it, you're going, oh, if I don't, it means I messed up. Mm. It wasn't just luck, it wasn't just whatever, it was I screwed up. Turning 30 kind of helped me take the pressure off because I think I I was battling this, this idea of what I would be when I'm 30. Mm. And as far as my acting career, it was very different than what I expected by the time I was 30. So it kind of was this like, all right, well, that that's it. Like, yeah. it, And so it was almost like a finishing a finish line in my head in a very messed up way of like, well, it's over. You've given yourself multiple lives, like how that guy gives himself four days in one day. Yeah. First day starts at nine and then yeah. it's You did that, that with your grind, life. That grind set guy. You're on the grind set. Yeah. Eat, eat, eat. Uh, I'll shut the hell up and let you and let mm. you eat. You wrote a journal entry in 2007, Shane, called The Meaning to Life. Oh. In it you say, if there is a meaning of life, it is for happiness, for love and friendship, and for learning. We can choose to kill and wage war or to give and help others while we live in this world we know so little about. What are your current emotions here in that? Man, I forgot I put that out there. You've really done your detective work. Do, do you regret it? No, that's the epitome of I'm 14 and this is deep. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Cause it's just like, yeah, everyone would be like, yeah, man, that's for sure. I don't know, it's it's one of those things where I'm like, okay, yes, there's truth to You're it. You're not wrong. I'm not it's wrong, it's just the most basic understanding of sure. things. I do have a lot of thoughts cause I was very religious when I was like in my early teens. Mm. And then honestly, by getting so into it, I fell out of it cause yeah, I was yeah. really reading it and, and like, like looking up a bunch of stuff. I wanted answers. I was I was mm. diving deep into the Bible. I, I I think at this stage, I my view, and you know, there's that philosopher Alan Watts who said this of like, oh, to sin is, it's been misinterpreted. It means to miss the mark. Yeah. And so it's like, oh, it's just you're you're striving for some sort of happiness in the wrong way. Mm -hmm. And I do look at people that way. And so I, I was thinking that at the time. So I still agree. Yeah, I just yeah. uh, I'm not writing journal entries about it anymore. <laughs> Uh, I'm writing journal entries about, um, I don't know, other bullshit. Yeah. What is it, we cringe but we are free? 
Mm -hmm. You know, like the, anybody can look back at any of their thoughts yeah. when they were 15. I was the opposite where I was like the virulent atheist because I grew up in such a Christian neighborhood right next to a mega church and I was like kind of the token Jew. And so I'd be like, you believe in the flying spaghetti monster? And nice. like, I hurt so many people that were close to me by just being a huge asshole, right? Yeah. And I look back at that and I cringe, but I also give myself so much like grace and empathy because I'm like, I know exactly where that was coming from. Do you have that same thing with your younger self? <sighs> also, can I dish you up some grape leaves? Yes. Oh, man. These are homemade bubble out. We've never Love done it before, grape but leaves. we're very proud of them. You know, I, I, I when I read back on things, I do cringe so hard. Mm -hmm. I cringe, though, largely because I could tell that even though it was in a private journal that I had no intention of showing to anyone, I was kind of performing. Mm -hmm. I'm reading this, I'm like, I'm trying to sound smart. I'm trying to sound philosophical. And I get so frustrated that I wasn't just letting my genuine feelings and thoughts out. Do you think you have those genuine? Uh, eat, eat. I'm gonna, show, I'm gonna show up and just sit here for a sec. I'm gonna watch you eat grape leaves. Mm. Mm hmm. So good, man. Why grape leaves, just a fan? Um, when I uh, first had this, I was, with, uh, I was with my friend Damien, who's also on Smosh, and he took me to, uh, I believe it was a Lebanese place. Mm -hmm. And I got some grape leaves and I was just like, what is this? I've never had anything like this before. Yeah. I'd say every month at least I'm ordering this from somewhere. Yeah. Uh, and I'm very lucky that in LA there's plenty of places that make it and it's just so delicious. Mm. Mm. Enjoy. Oh. What's the deal with the veggies? I love vegetables. I love green vegetables so much. This one's kind of more I needed to pay homage to what I do eat a lot, <laughs> like every day. You know, yeah. this is something I do cook. If I'm, it's my last meal. I kind of wanted to pick things from like all over. Mm -hmm. So I'm like things from my childhood, things from things I'll never get again, chicken crispers. But then I'm like also things that just bring me back to just every day. You're paying homage to current you. I knew you guys would make it better than I do. So I was like, oh. We'll come over to your house and we'll make it for you. Only mm -hmm. on your deathbed though. And we got to record it because everything is content. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> It was super evident that you were a very self-serious kid. If you have ever watched an interview with you from before you were 18, the Dear Lemon Lima press tour, yeah. you're doing an interview, you, you're already shaking your head in shame. It's actually an incredible like look into who you were and who you are, um, which I'm sure is more fascinating to me than you who lived it. But you are there with your co-star Vanessa Morano on Clever TV, and Vanessa is talking about like, we would go get ice cream as a cast and we're all friends and it's so fun. We shot in Seattle and it's beautiful. And then they turn the camera to you and you go, my character Philip Georgie was incredibly arrogant. He feels that he's smart than everybody else. So I, I, would, I would walk around set with that same air of arrogance. And I really tried to play it like Jason Schwartzman from Rushmore. Yeah. Because he's not a jerk as in like the regular jerk, like, oh, what's up, I'm a jerk. It was, it was more of an arrogance of I'm smarter than everybody around. Oh. I was, it was an impersonation of, uh, of Jason Schwartzman. And it's very obvious that you have this entirely different tone than all of your co-stars. Did you feel sort of like um, apart from them in that way? On set, I, th I think that's more of an indication of how my nerves would affect me mm -hmm. there in those interviews and how I wanted to be perceived. Yeah. But on set, I had such a great time yeah. there. I mean, I'm still friends with, with Vanessa to this day. Uh, I made so many friends on that set and I it really was such a blast. I think it does show how especially when I was younger, my insecurity made me like hide who I am mm -hmm. and who I am is such a silly person. And I don't think, I don't think people at large got to see that until I was on Smosh for like a while. Yeah. And then I just kind of became comfortable with it and I was on camera so much. You can tell like, mm -hmm. oh, I want to be a dramatic, serious actor. I want to be seen as cool. I want to be taken seriously. My name is Daniel Shane Lewis. Yeah, exact, exactly. No, Daniel Day-Lewis was like my inspiration. I <laughs> I really wanted to be taken seriously for so long in my life. And honestly, it it just kind of, that, that I regret more than anything. I wish I could go back and just be like, man, it's okay to be silly. It's okay to not be seen as a certain thing. Like, mm -hmm. just be, just be yourself. And And what's funny is, as soon as I was on Smosh and just letting it, letting it loose and just being an idiot was when I probably suddenly had the most fame. Yeah. You know, when I suddenly got recognition, when people actually started paying attention to me in any sort of way. So I, I, I just wasn't embracing who I was. 
and those interviews really show it. It's really funny to watch them. Well, you can even see in in your body language, like you don't yeah. even seem comfortable the way that you do now, mm -hmm. um, which is also reasonable because you're a kid and dealing with so much. And I'm also wearing like, I, I'm literally, I mean, I'm, I'm at the epitome of 2009 yeah. in some of those interviews, like black hair, Everything's black. I, I I would swear back then that I didn't like, like I hated Twilight and Edward Cullen. Yeah. But I'm trying my best to dress like Edward Cullen in that interview. It's so funny. I wore a lot of beyond the knee Michael Jordan uh, basketball shorts, and so I wouldn't want to go see myself back then either. No, that's that's sick, dude. <laughs> that's <sick. laughs> that's freaking rad, man. <laughs> You're gonna get to round number three. Let's do it. Shane, for course number three, you said you really love garlic naan with just like all the sauces. And so we made you a giant tower of garlic naan with sag paneer, with chicken tikka masala, with raita, with cilantro chutney and tamarind chutney. Uh, please just go tear at the beast. Enjoy to your heart's contentment. Oh my God. This is how you guys are gonna kill me after too. Uh, I've never seen anything like this. Uh, laughs are cheap, we want gasps. Oh my God, okay. Yeah, I knew I needed a bread in this, mm -hmm. and I decided on garlic naan because every time I've had it, it's just the best. Mm. Mm. It was homemade too. We had to invent a new contraption. This is great naan too. Oh, this is so good. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You have like a lot of simpler foods on this curly fries, chicken crispers, but like you also seem like somebody who does really like kind of chase flavor and chase new experiences. Absolutely. I don't talk about it a lot, but I, I love food. I'm a, mm. a super foodie. Um, the first time I had garlic naan, it was in it was actually in lockdown. It wasn't that long ago, and I I I had the sag paneer. I had the chicken tikka masala. You know, like mm -hmm. the the like easy the basic order, but having the garlic naan and just dipping it in yeah. anything was the best part. Mm -hmm. I was obsessed with it. Um, I I haven't had a ton of Indian food, and I need to go in person more mm. so that I can really like. <laughs> mix it around and, and try different things. I'll take you to my favorite all-you-can-eat buffet on Sunday, and they do a good job. They don't water down the tikka, they don't water down the chutneys like the other places. Let's do it. Um, Jane, we both exist in the same very strange economy mm -hmm. where you're performing a sort of exaggerated and more entertaining version of yourself, and you've always said that it's important for you to differentiate between your on-screen persona and your off-screen person. What's the biggest difference between Shane the Persona and Shane the Person? I, I would say a big one is that in life, I'm not as like funny. I don't think. I think You're I'm not. A little, a I'm very chill. I'm also not real downer. Uh, yeah, to be around. I'm really depressing. Nobody likes um, you. No, but I'm I'm very like downplayed. I think yeah. a lot of times I am. I'm very shy. I have a lot of social anxiety. So when I meet new people, I'm very quiet. I mm. think, and I'm just. I try to just be very polite. Um, whereas on camera, I, I I think I say things more rudely a lot because I'm just going for the laugh. Yeah. I'm like, however I need to get it, and if I, that means roasting my friends or whatever. But in life, I'm not really roasting people that much. Yeah, it was interesting earlier when you said, like, I was acting so serious, but I am a silly person. There's no, like, but, right? It's, I was acting really serious, and I'm a silly person. Right, but I'm also not serious in that way either. I think, you know, it's, I it's think like you a, might be, you were deliberately edgy in the way that a lot yeah. of teens were, but I think you are like an incredibly thoughtful uh, person who's like very deliberate with their words in a way that I really have always appreciated. Yes, I'm a very careful person. Th that's probably the biggest difference. Mm. In, in life, I'm very careful with how I speak and what I say. And then on camera, I, you, you just don't think. Yeah. You just start talking, you just start going. I'm doing that a little bit right now. Um, <laughs> but but on Smosh, especially anything like comedy, I just go and you almost don't think and, and it's almost a blur from action to cut. And then it ends and you're like, I hope that was good. Yeah. And then you watch it later. And I'm so often, it's so trippy. I will watch our videos and be like, I just don't remember this at all. Yeah, I same. have no memory, no recollection. You got a psychology degree from ASU online. Go online, Sun Devils. I never watched a game. No applause. Do you ever feel like that? Like you are a completely different person on camera and then off, and where do those things meet? I don't think I feel like a different person. I think it just, at this stage, is so routine. Mm. Like improv is so routine in a way that that it's like a muscle memory more yeah. so. Um, it's kind of the same, I mean, you can relate to this of when you go to the gym a lot and you have your workout routine, 
almost when you stick to a, the same routine for too long, mm -hmm. you you can kind of just be zoned out because you've done it so much. Mm -hmm. I think it's more akin to that than like I'm a different person now. Yeah. It's just like all right, I'm doing I'm doing the thing I do every day. Yeah, yeah. Um, you also said that privacy is really important to you. Mm-hmm. Shane, I don't, I don't know if you know this. You got a wife. I know. You got a wife named Courtney Miller. Mm-hmm. Equally talented performer and actor. What was the decision like to finally go public with that? Like, when did the burden of keeping things private um, sort of like outweigh this fear of an invasion of privacy? Because that's something that we we all deal with. How much do we give outwardly? Right. Yeah, and I think the big thing for me, for both of us, was we just didn't want to make there, there's certain things that I'm like, this is not content. Yeah. I don't make money off of this because that was for me a decision for my own brain. We also simultaneously were like, okay, at some point, it's gonna be easier on our lives mm. if we're just upfront about this huge thing. And I think we knew for a long time, especially once we were engaged, that okay, once we get married, we'll announce that. That's where we're gonna do it. And so we knew that for, for a, a long time. And then uh, it was like, okay, we're getting married at the end of March. Should we just announce it on April Fools? And I, it was Courtney who pitched it, and I was like, that's funny. And then every person we I love told, that you're not ta you're talking about like keeping things separate from content. And you're like, yeah. So my wife pitched me. Yeah, it's like idea. okay here, but I was like, that's funny. That's yeah. really funny, and that is us. Everyone we told were like, w was just like, that's so funny. Yeah. And like, all right, mm -hmm. we'll, we'll do this. And it also I think was a way of like. Announcing this thing, but also being like, let's not take this too seriously. Yeah. Like, this is is not it's not a big deal. It was fun. I I don't regret it at all. But when a few <laughs> days pass and people were still like, I don't know if it's real, and then you're like, okay, settle down. But um, you know, a lot of it also that we the reason we announced it was because fans were speculating so much about our relationship, ah. and through speculation, they were trying to dig to a almost cyber stalking level of trying to pe like figure out what where I was where she was and trying to find our locations to to prove that we're at the same place at the oh same time so it was also hoping that it would kind of kill that and yeah. that it's like all right you guys know we're together so stop stop caring um and honestly to a degree it has worked they, yeah. they that that aspect of it has died down now that they just know. If you continue to like extrapolate your career on YouTube, I mean, like you said, who knows where this goes, does that like increased level of invasiveness ever really worry you? Yeah, I mean, there's so many ways where I'm really grateful that I'm not like famous, yeah. right? At the same time, with a lot of big celebrities, they kind of have more of a general audience. I think people with YouTubers think they have more of a connection. Yeah. So I think, I actually think there's probably a lot of YouTubers out there with, you know, 5,000 subscribers who are dealing with extreme levels of like stalking and mm -hmm. cyber stalking because this parasocial stuff can really get out of hand. I have met YouTubers who I watch religiously mm -hmm. and it is a weird feeling because you're like, oh, I've, I've heard you talk so much and you've never seen or heard me in your entire life. Yeah. And it's a trippy feeling. I think I'm very lucky though in that Smosh, where we're at now in our fan base, they seem mostly obsessed with, you know, our content and what we're creating. And mm -hmm. I've always said like for fans, what what the people you're a fan of really appreciate is when you let them know that you're a fan of what they're making. Big like time. that's yeah. what that is what you're a fan of. And even if you think like, oh, well, I love this this personality uh, content creator and mm -hmm. I, I love them. It's like you love the like personality content they're yeah. making. That's what you're a fan of. And that's great. And a parasocial relationship between a fan and a YouTuber is a real relationship in its own way. Mm -hmm. But it's not like it's not the same as what you have with your friends or your family. Yeah. And I think it's important to make that distinction and to cherish both. Do you ever, I, I feel sometimes this sense of, it's almost strange, like a paternalistic connection. I've had like real connections with fans where they tell me like a, a personal story, but you are a very different version of yourself. And I like what you said about them being a fan of what you make, right? Not of mm -hmm. you because the real you is never, even this shooting last meals, I've said stuff on this show that like, you know, it was very, very personal to me, but it's still not the real me. Mm -hmm. necessarily. How yeah. important is, is, is it for you to like only keep that real you for people? It's it's pretty important to me. I, I, I really do keep that distinction and 
I think people know by this point that anything I do online, for the most part, especially on my own social media, I'm, I'm trying to be silly. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to entertain you. I view it as entertainment. Um, and, and to a degree where I'm almost sad that I don't get to use social media in the genuine way it was designed, which was to connect with your friends and your, you know, yeah. your social circles. Uh, when I'm posting, I am thinking about my followers. Yeah. And I'm just like, this is for you. Yeah. It's all for them. So. It's always been it's for you. It's all for you. <laughs> Ready to get into the final round? Let's do it. Shane, for the final course of your final meal, we got the apple cobbler with the ice cream, and then we got a stack of buttermilk pancakes with plenty yeah. of butter and real Vermont maple syrup over here. Awesome. I will let you know, when my mom would ask me about what my last meal would be as a kid, I, I would say pancakes. I would definitely be like, there, there's definitely gonna be pancakes in there, just because it's classic. Can I syrup you up, or do you want to syrup Syrup yourself? me up, dude. I'm a heavy syrup guy. You oh, same, syrup? same. Yeah, just, yeah, I mean. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Solid. I want to be able to soak each bite in the syrup. Oh, yeah. And then it becomes be drenched. <laughs> really alarming how much syrup you've consumed over the course of pancakes. I mean, hey. Oh, God. Oof. We're not leaving this booth until all these pancakes are eaten, too. I'm rolling out of this booth. <laughs> Do we still have the wheelbarrow? Bring it in. Mm. I don't want to talk about anything more. I just want to eat pancakes. It's ASMR for the next 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. You got too close to the mic. We're gonna eat this. We're gonna eat this pancake here. This is not a sexual thing by nature. No, it's but not. I know some of you are using it for that, and that's okay. But that's okay. You're safe here. Do whatever you want. Just make sure your mom doesn't walk into the room. Jane, you once said in an interview when you were 17. I love, I'm obsessed with 17 year old Jane. <laughs> oh, no, honestly, I'll tell you what. <laughs> Because I recognize so much of my 17-year-old edgelord self in there, and I think you and I have both let go of that in yeah. different ways as we've gotten older. Absolutely. Especially having gone through, like, all the weird rigors of the constant pressure of YouTube, and then finally getting yourself to release from it and reaching clarity. <laughs> Found a stack of pancakes. But, you did say, if you love doing something, you just gotta do it. Maybe it'll be hard, maybe you won't make enough money for a while, but you're gonna be happy with your life. Did that prophecy come true? Are you doing what you love and has it led to happiness? Wow. Um, you know what? Yeah, it did work out. Yeah. And it worked out in ways that I didn't expect. I don't think I fully realized at 17 what I loved. Yeah. Because I was still at that time trying to be a dramatic actor. Once I got on Smosh and I was doing it for a while, I think it I think it took me a minute to really accept like this is what I couldn't have found a, a better place to be and a mm -hmm. better job for for what I want to do. And so in so many ways, even though I'm not doing what 17 year old me pictured I'd be doing, I, I am actually doing what makes me happiest and what I think I'm actually best at. Mm. I just wasn't willing to accept it back then. Like it found me more than I found it. Um, so in a way the prophecy came true. You've already broken your life up into two parts. <laughs> Let's say there's a third part. Okay. What do you think's happening in that third act for Shane and also, do you think that you would look back at 30-year-old you and cringe just as hard as you looking back on 15-year-old you? No, um, I mean, it's a good thing to look back on yourself and cringe or regret or something because I think that means you've grown, right? Mm -hmm. Or yeah. I imagine I will look back on this and I do hope to be like, oh God, like this guy. But I, I also think at this stage, I, I hope to look back and, and be proud. Um, I look back on a lot of stuff over the past 10 to 15 years and I'm like, all right, <laughs> cringy, silly, but cool. Like, yeah. I, I respect it. Still. It's important to like actually still give yourself those props. And also, I still hope that you do end up doing some dramatic roles. I saw one dramatic role that you did. It was in a so random sketch, I think. <laughs> Martin Scorsese actually took some inspo from the yeah. Irishman. Uh -huh. but, uh, Damien was actually the teacher, and the joke was that he pronounced the word 40. Oh yeah, he was our Irish teacher, so As, he, he would say uh, 240 would be too farty. Too farty. And so all the students are just making him say 240 as much as they can. Uh, but you, there, there, was, there was empathy behind your eyes. Shane, I thought you really channeled <laughs> Daniel Day-Lewis in that moment. No, you know. Damien and I met up in the trailer beforehand and we talked through the nuance of mm. that scene and you know we wanted to really go back through the history of, of Ireland and all the struggles and yeah. and we wanted to bring that out and show that in this you know like this sketch I'm like 
they think this is about a guy who can't say 240 correctly. Mm. This is about the troubles. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it's about the crown. No, no, I saw that. It was yeah, about the crown. It's, it's season four of the crown. <laughs> uh, that's what we're watching. You said you would have been a therapist if you weren't acting. Mm-hmm. You also said that you got some imposter syndrome. Can you do a little like self-therapizing here? And this isn't totally for me at all, at all, Shane. But if some people had imposter syndrome, how would you actually help them through that? I, I Really, the best you can do is ask questions. Now, I'm not, I have a bachelor's in psychology, which means I have a general education with, <laughs> but I took a lot of psychology classes. Yeah, yeah. I am in way no more way, than I've done, man. I'm in no way a therapist. It would take <laughs> so many thousands of hours to become a therapist. But um, I think if I had, with friends who have imposter syndrome, the best you can do is is to, ask questions and, mm-hmm. and to lead them to to realizing the absurdity of it. And mm-hmm. also just, there's no point in it, right? Yeah. You know, you're here, you're doing the thing. You're so obsessed with, with the failure of it that you're not even gonna get to enjoy the doing of it. Mm-hmm. Um, it was actually something I learned in an acting class, which um, my, my coach, he, he pointed out to me, he's like, you're only thinking about messing up this scene. And so you're gonna mess up the scene because that's all you're thinking about. That becomes your goal. He's like, focus on what you want. What I do a lot, because I still have imposter syndrome, is I find myself in my head thinking that I can think my way out of it. And you just can't. <laughs> you're never gonna think your way out of uh, anxiety. You're never gonna That spiral think. never goes up, it only goes down. And, and to accept like, I'm not gonna think my way out of this. Yeah. There's no thought that's gonna fix this. There's no uh, realization that's gonna make this go away. I have to accept that this is happening. Mm. I have imposter syndrome. It's there, cool. What do you want? Yeah. What makes you happy? Think about that. Or and, and if you can't think about that, that's okay. Acknowledge that that's gonna still be there and go on despite it. That, in a similar way with how nervous I used to get in auditions was something I had to accept of I'm nervous. Yeah. I'm nervous and I have to go do this. Okay, I have no choice. Yeah. Over time, the nerves just went away because I just failed enough. And that that the failures end up being a gift because you do it enough where your body starts to go, all right, uh, well, I'm not gonna supply you with this anymore because it's not making a difference. Yeah, if you keep holding on to those failures, biologically, your body's just gonna shut down. So yeah. it just learns to not right. hold on to it. And you know, at this stage in my life, and I think this is where I hope to be in 20 to 30 years is like the outcome not being the reason I'm doing stuff, right? Yeah. Especially now where we're doing so much of what we set out to do. Like we're doing the thing. Would I rather be right Yeah, now. so we're doing the thing that we wanted to mm-hmm. do. So it's it's more trying to get into that flow state. Like what I'm jealous of now is when I see people who are just locked in yeah. and enjoying the thing. That's what I want. I just want that. I don't care if people think it's good. I don't care if it's successful. I care about doing something and and really being in the moment with it and having a blast. That rules, man. Eat your cobbler. The cobbler. Okay, yeah. The ice cream's getting warm. The cobbler's getting warm. Yeah, but that's good. It's I, I like when it's a little bit melted. I like the soup. I'm here for the soup. Mmm. Yeah. So good. I don't know that there's a better taste in the world? That's what I've always said. What this is my favorite dessert. What could it be? Is this a proper cobbler to you? Because there's a lot of... There's a lot of drama, at least in my world. I'll be honest, I have no idea. Um, I think when I sent you guys this list, I said apple cobbler, pie, doesn't matter. It just <laughs> needs to be like hot cinnamon apple mm-hmm. with vanilla ice cream, and this nails it. First time I had this, I was a kid, and I was at my uncle's house, and my uncle was a chef. And he, I didn't know that. he was in the kitchen, he was cooking up just like a storm, mm. uh, but it was the first time I ever saw a chef, like a professional chef in action, where they're cooking, but they're also cleaning at the same time. Yeah, yeah. And I was amazed that by the time he was done making steak and mashed potatoes and like green beans for everyone, the kitchen was just perfectly clean. Mm-hmm. I couldn't believe it. And then he just quickly whipped up some apple cobbler and ice cream. And I was like, this is the best, this is the best thing I've ever had in my entire life. Yeah. And I, every time I have the option to get it, I get it from then on. <laughs> Shane, what happens when you die? Where do we go? Here's what I want. Here's yeah, what yeah. I here's what I've thought. Uh, I, here's what I want. I think, I, I kind of. I guess it's kind of a like a more Eastern philosophy of like I don't know if there's an individual. Mm. I mm. I've often described it as like you hold up a piece of paper to a light and you poke holes and you go the holes are us. 
but the light is like life and experience and stuff. Yeah. So we are that, all of us, but we're experiencing a bunch of different individual things. And so, I don't know, I, I, think, I think it goes on forever. I, th I think I think goes on forever, and I think the idea is to experience everything that can possibly exist, which is everything. So it's just a never-ending, infinite, whatever. I know that I think that whatever it is is so unbelievably far beyond my comprehension. That's that I do firmly believe that. Yeah, and that's that's where I kind of end it. It's just gonna keep going until a monkey fully types out the words of Shakespeare on a typewriter, and then they're gonna go, yes. and scene, and yes. it's black. And then we get a reboot, <laughs> and then we get a sequel. <laughs> and it, it's, it's all IP, But it's really. worse, it's worse. Yeah. Life number two, and you're Ugh. like, ah, oh, this sucks. This seems redundant. And Robert Downey Jr. plays it, and you're like, okay. <laughs> you're like, you got paid what? Jane, you ready for the lightning round? Yeah, let's do the lightning round. <laughs> Who's the one person, dead or alive, you'd wanna share your actual last meal with? Uh, someone from uh, far in the future, just oh. ten thousand years in the future. Someone from there, that would be cool. Robert Downey Jr. Jr. Daddy. Yes, there we go. <laughs> what song do you want to be played at your funeral? Oof, uh, just just some some nice like instrumental, just classic <laughs> instrumental saxophone. Just a just like a, a saxophone. royalty free. Saxophone. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Don't blow the budget, guys. <laughs> Who would win in a fight, The Chosen or Courtney freaking Miller? Uh, I, oof. Uh, with prep time, The uh, Chosen. We'll five days prep. Five days prep, Courtney freaking Miller. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> What's your biggest fear? My biggest fear is um, uh, uh, hurting, hurting others, mm -hmm. hurting someone. Who is your favorite pizza place? My favorite pizza place, my actual favorite pizza place is a place in Arizona called Barrow's Pizza. Is there a silent S before it? it no, it's Barrows. It's not Sbarro. It's Barrows. <laughs> it, it's B A R R O, Barrows, which is hilarious. I'm like authentic no. Arizona pizza. Sbarro. Yeah, Love yeah. It. Uh, what's the hardest goodbye you've ever had to say? Oh my god, um, probably every time I I say goodbye to my my grandpa, because mm. because he cries, and I'm just like. Oh, Okay, man. <laughs> like you know, and he's like a retired colonel, uh, like in the air force. Oh so he's like God. this very like serious guy. But then when you see like he, you'll just say goodbye, and then you'll see him like with a tear in his eye, and you're like, oh my God, dude. So Sounds like a Folgers that. commercial. Yeah, but every goodbye is hard. Yeah. Smash, Mary, Kill, Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark, Oof. the Before Trilogy, and Spirited Away. Okay. Um, I will. Ooh, I will marry uh, Indiana Jones. Or no. I will unfortunately have to kill Spirited Away, uh, but that's okay. There's a lot of spirits in that. <laughs> they're all good. They're, they're, most of them are already dead. Fine. Uh, I will uh, lo love, or what was the? What was the we said smash, but smash. Like, that's, too, that's very like smash, 2011. I smash like the Before I, I Trilogy. I yeah, mean, come on, they're so sexy. And then uh, <laughs> Mary Indiana Jones, Raiders yeah, of Lost Ark. He's rugged, he's, he's handsome. the best, dude. You know? Come on. I've never seen it. What's your greatest regret in life? My greatest regret in life is all the time I've spent like not doing stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the classic answer, but I, I wished I'd have failed more by this yeah. point. Are you happy? Yeah, I am happy. You look happy. Thanks. That's the mustache, it really helps. I know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Shane, if you wanna look into that camera right there and deliver your final words. Uh, see ya. <laughs> Wouldn't want to be a Shane. Truly, man. Thank you so much for stopping by. I had a rad conversation. And honestly, I, I love diving into the psyche of teenage you it's, and 30 year old. Thank you so much. This uh, has been incredible. Shane, tell the people where they can find you. Uh, you can find me at Smosh, um, Smosh Pit, Smosh Games, Smosh, and uh, Smosh Cast, where I host the Smosh Mouth podcast with my friend Amanda. And then um, I'm, on, I'm on Instagram, I'm on TikTok. I'm, uh, I'm all over the place doing stupid stuff, but you probably know that. If you want to find him, you can find him. Yeah. And thank you so much for stopping my Mythical Kitchen. We got new episodes out all the time. Drop a comment on who else you want to see on Last Meals. Or don't. Face the reality of mortality head on with our new Last Meals hoodie. Available now at mythical.com.